Welcome to the channel. If you enjoy listening to horror stories and you're new to this channel, you should join us by clicking subscribe down below. I upload new stories every single night. Guys, please can we get 300 likes too? Thank you. Let's begin. My hair was a complete mess. My eyes were sunken deep into my skull. I could barely keep myself awake long enough to not fall back into my bed, or worse, fall down to the wooden floor and get myself hurt. I hated that I had to wake up this early to prepare for work, but I needed the paycheck, so I had to suck it up and deal with it like I've been doing every other day. I slowly made my way down to the bathroom and tried desperately to comb through my messy mane of hair in an attempt to get some sort of life back into my appearance. It's kind of funny how much a person's life can change within the right amount of time. Everything that used to be special about you is gone without a trace. People often go out of their way to say time heals all wounds, but nobody ever wants to talk about the wounds that time itself creates. The scars and the bruises that will never heal no matter how much time passes. It took three years in the workforce to lose my female prowess. It happened so fast that I didn't even realise when it all went away. I wasn't exactly sure what changed or how it changed. But something did. Some fundamental thing in me just gave up on trying to be attractive anymore. I told myself that I didn't live for that kind of attention, but the truth was that I missed it. I miss being the topic of discussion everywhere I meant. I miss being the one person in the room that everybody wanted to talk to. I miss the way people looked at me with admiration. I tied my hair back into a bun and splashed a little bit of water on my face to rid the drowsiness that I still felt. I wanted so badly to go back to my bed, but there were more important things than sleep. I got done brushing my teeth before heading downstairs to fix myself something to eat. I knew I would have to leave soon if I wanted to make it to work on time. I got some bread from the refrigerator and started eating while waiting for my coffee to brew. The sound of my cell phone ringing startled me slightly, and I nearly dropped the piece of bread I was eating onto the floor. I scrambled to pick up the phone from the kitchen, and answered it without looking at the caller ID. Oh my god, it's happening! A familiar voice yelled from the other end of the phone. I pulled the phone out of my ear for a few seconds, before putting it back. It's seven o'clock in the morning. Why are you so loud? I asked, still rubbing my ear from the deafening noise. He proposed. The familiar voice continued to scream uncontrollably. I still didn't know who this was on the phone, but I had to look at my phone screen before saying anything else. I checked the caller ID and it was my sister Emma. I wide smiled and couldn't actually believe it. Congratulations, Em. When's the wedding? I said between fits of giggles. It's in four weeks. He's so cute. He just proposed. I love him so much, she said in between her excitement rambling. After a couple of minutes of listening to my sister ramble happily over the phone, I decided it was time to get ready for work. I finished having breakfast and went upstairs to pick an outfit for the day before hitting the shower. I showered quickly because I knew I wouldn't be able to make it to work if I wasted any more time than I already did. I dried off and put on the outfit that I picked before leaving my house. I grabbed my purse and my keys from the small table next to the door and exited the apartment. I locked the door behind me and headed for my car. 
I thought today was going to be the perfect day because of the good news my sister shared with me, but all it did was make me realise how sad my life was. Between the both of us, Emma has always been the shy one. She didn't have a lot of friends and was almost a ghost in college, yet somehow she's getting a marriage proposal and I'm getting my neck stuck deeper and deeper into work. I never really gave much thought to the fact that guys no longer asked me out like they used to, or that I no longer went out to parties to loosen up like I used to. I just assumed it was a phase in my life that would soon pass, but after that call with Emma, I realised I was just making excuses to justify the fact that I was no longer having a life outside of work. I tried to drown the sad thoughts that filled my head with the fact that my sister was getting married and I should be happy for her, but it didn't work. No matter how hard I strained to push away the pessimistic thoughts, they seemed to gain even more strength in my mind. I got tired of feeling sorry for myself. Later at work that day, I made it a point to download every dating app I could find on the Play Store. You know Emma, she's younger than me by quite a bit, and at this point I was in my mid-thirties, childless, and still no husband, no one. I felt like time was running out, and for some reason I had multiple panic attacks that day, thinking that I would die alone, a single little old lady in her rocking chair, watching the people walk by in front of her house. I had no idea what to do on these apps, I didn't know what kind of pictures would get me a quick match, so I used some of my lewd college pictures. I didn't want to be one of those people that lied on the internet, but I didn't have a choice. These photos were from almost 14 years ago, and also were slutty as hell. I wanted a relationship, and I wanted it now. I got three matches on Tinder and six matches on Bumble within the hour. I started chatting with one of my Tinder matches and he suggested we meet up for dinner later that night. He was only a mile away according to the radius on the app. I got off work and drove straight to the address he gave me. It was a pretty big house with two stories and it reminded me somewhat of my childhood home. Except this house was bigger and grander. The gates were open so I drove into the driveway and parked my car up. I knocked on the white painted wood with a single ring and waited patiently for someone to answer the door. I waited a minute or two before the door opened, revealing an attractive young man in his late twenties. He had a sharp menacing gaze, but his blue eyes made it seem soft instead of harsh like he was trying to convey something difficult to express. The expression on his face softened considerably the second he saw me and my heart skipped a beat. I tried not to let my feelings get the best of me, after all this was my first time meeting him, and I hadn't been laid in over five years. That's how bad it got, but it was at this split second that I remembered, it was all by choice. Now, I was back in the market, baby. Natalie? He asked in a low and gentle tone. Yep, that's me, I replied timidly. I'm Eric. He smiled warmly at me before opening the door wider and gesturing for me to come inside. We entered the foyer of the house together and I stood awkwardly as he led the way towards a huge set of double doors. He pushed open the door and ushered me into a huge dining table. The room was dimly lit and had candles laid out. The table was stacked full with plates and different foods. We talked and tried to get to know each other while we ate. He seemed to smile a lot, but I noticed he didn't like to look at my face, and his smiles were mostly forced. We eventually finished our meals and I excused myself to the restroom. I followed the directions he gave me, but along the way I got completely lost. 
This house was huge, and if I was to guess, had up to 15 bedrooms. But for whatever reason, according to Eric, there were only three bathrooms in the entire house, which didn't quite add up. On top of this, he was the only person in this whole house. It didn't cross my mind until I left the table and actually took in and had a deep breath of the whole scenario. I kept walking, trying to figure out and remember where I went wrong based on Eric's directions. All of a sudden, I found myself walking down a long corridor with multiple doors either side that seemed to lead into different rooms. I tried one of the doors and it led through into a bedroom. The bedroom looked like it hadn't been touched in years. It was clean but dirty at the same time. For example, all the bedding looked untouched, there was nothing in the room, but I could see layers of dust all over the drawers and sideboards. I quickly stepped backwards and shut the door in front of me and kept going. At this point, I was pretty desperate to go to the restroom, so I broke out into a little jog. That was when I started hearing barking noises coming from the other side of one of the doors. The barks sound deep and extremely loud. I edged nearer to the door. I'm a huge dog lover. I love dogs and I'd grown up with dogs in my family house. Instinctively, I always greet all dogs, which sometimes isn't a good thing. I walked up to the door where I was certain that the barking was coming from. I twisted the door handle and opened the door. Then, I just opened the door to the most painful hour of my entire life. Out came two German Shepherd dogs, fully grown. One latched onto my calf and my front shin and began mauling, shaking me from side to side. The other came up to the front of my torso at the top and dug its teeth into my shoulders. At this point, I started screaming for my life. Eric must have heard as around 30 seconds later, I see him running up the corridor towards us. He grabs both of the dogs, but they're not letting go. If anything, Eric grabbing hold of them makes it way worse. There was blood pouring out of my leg and my shoulder, and the pain was so bad that I felt like I was going to fall asleep i.e. pass out. It was so bad that I shut my eyes, I prayed to God that somehow Eric would get the dogs off me. Eventually he managed to, but it got to the point where he was about to shoot one of them, that's how bad it was. He locked them both back in the room. After the dog attack, he didn't want to call the medics or 911, he knew he'd get in the shit, and even though he didn't, I did. When the medics arrived, they also called the police afterwards. Both of the dogs were confiscated and I had to go to the hospital to have some type of sedation. They ended up doing scars and disinfecting the wounds. They also gave me a couple of shots in my right arm. I guess it was to do with infections. I did survive, I didn't get an infection, and yes, it was extremely painful. I blocked Eric on Tinder. I never spoke to him again, and I ended up pissing myself all over the floor while being mauled by two full-grown German Shepherds. Yay, that's fun. Maybe I should have just been happy for Emma, gone to her wedding, and planned to get into dating a little more patiently. Hey, my name's Jacob, and I consider myself a high-value man. I'm 21 years old, I make six figures, and I'm six foot three. No, I'm not lying. These are important before I start today's story. The truth is, when I'm at this level, I feel like a god. No, I don't have supercars, but I do have a Rolls Royce. I like the idea of quiet wealth, not the type that shouts and screams in people's faces. Look at me, look how big my pee-pee is. No, I think true wealth whispers, 
And in fact, although I tried to keep my head down, it became evident to all my friends and family that I was doing insane, even for my early 20s. I ran two online businesses and worked full time in finance. So when I put together all three income sources, I was loaded. One thing I had to consider was picking a girl wisely. I've always been a big player in my life. I've had 10 girlfriends leading up to the age of 18 and I was a bit of a crazy dude. Jacob the Jesser, that was my nickname. Back in high school, all the girls wanted me. I think it was mainly because of my looks and my height, but now I have money, it was a new kind of dangerous. I had power at my fingertips that I never knew I could control, and that type of power in the wrong hands goes horribly wrong. So that's my introduction, to give you a brief idea of who I am. Also, this type of power in people my age's hands would destroy them. Give every average 20 year old dude the money I was on, a Rolls Royce not on finance, and a bunch of other things, they'd lose their mind. I had to keep myself conservative, and if anything, I lived wilder when I was 17 versus now in my early 20s. I was single however, and possibly the worst thought in my mind was trying to find a woman that actually loved me for who I was. While I do follow Black Pill, I don't like the idea of that saying, but it is kind of true. Obviously a girl is going to like you for your looks, your height, something about your personality or a cool hobby and skill you can achieve, but if you have nothing to offer, she can't simply love your soul. I don't know, maybe you're a hippie and you believe in that type of thing, but I don't. Women are attracted to all different things, not just body, looks or money. It depends on the girl. The problem was, I just needed to find the right one. Dating apps are basically the trash of society. But it was 2018. How the hell am I supposed to find a girlfriend meeting in a bowling alley, a pub, a nightclub, or anywhere social in real life? All the girls at these places dressed like absolute hookers, tiny tight dresses, they're just showing off their curves. To me, it was nice to look at, but when you look at it from a true perspective, it's disgusting. I was on all the apps, you name it. Every single dating app I could download on my phone, I had it. And yes, my profile did have me stood with my Rolls Royce, my dog, nature photos, friends photos, etc. I do a bit of weightlifting from time to time, so my profile was pretty loaded. I had in total 7 pictures, on top of that I had a big bio which explained me, my goals in life, what I did and obviously my height. I would get a lot of matches every single day, but most of them I could just sense only swipe for me because they respected me. I feel that truly women only want to be with a guy that they respect. Whether that be because he's tall, has dominant personalities, or is skilled, or just a loving husband, that's still something to respect. When I started looking on Tinder, I came across so many women that I found attractive. I could have DM'd all of them and set up one night stands. As I said, a guy in his early 20s could lose his mind with this type of power. At this time in my life I was also considering financing a Lamborghini Huracan, which is a car almost $300,000. It's an ultimate head turnover, does 0 to 60 in under 3 seconds, and is just a flashy car. That's not silent wealth, that's screaming in people's faces. It was so tempting, but I just had to stay with my Rolls Royce. Once I got talking to some girls, it was quite difficult having a running conversation. Most of them started asking what I did, some even sent me things like, oh, how much do you earn? It was really awkward, kind of embarrassing, and a little off-putting. I found that most of the girls with the least revealing photos, who were kind of nerdy, were actually the most attractive, 
not physically, but simply personality-wise, I decided that I needed to set up a date. It was now or never. Think about it. I was in my early 20s, and soon I'd be in my mid-20s. The worst thing I could do right now is leave it another year, then another year, and another, and another. Before I know it, I'll be 30 years old, yes, a millionaire, but single, alone, and depressed. It doesn't matter how many Lambos you have, how many Rolls Royces, or how big your castle or mansion is. If you're on your own, you have no children, family, nieces, grandparents to share it with. Then, what's the point? You might as well just live in a single room in the middle of New York City. It makes no difference. I'm the kind of guy that thinks like this, so I was in an urgent state of mind to try and settle down and find wifey material, as they say on the internet. A few weeks passed of me talking to normal girls. When I say normal girls, I mean the type of girl that looked like she was a librarian, a cafeteria waitress, or just a girl that looked good, was in shape, but wasn't flaunting her body. I got talking to a girl called Grace. Grace was a few years younger than me, at 19. She was studying at university, one down the road from where I was. We were talking for a few weeks initially, back and forth over Snapchat, WhatsApp, and Tinder. I don't like to use Tinder for messaging, as you can't send voice notes. Well, at least in 2018 you couldn't. I haven't been on there since. I got to meet up with Grace, and we went for our first date. She was a lovely girl, around 5 foot 4, so quite short. I like short girls. She had frizzy, blonde hair that curled in strands so mighty they'd make her Greek prince jealous. Yeah, her hair was nice. We went out for dinner a couple times actually, and I started to fall in love with her. I know that sounds cheesy, but we spent long nights together. Evening walks, drives in the Rolls Royce, she came back to mine, and you know what happened. One thing led to another, and before I knew it, I was having a passionate relationship with Grace. It sparked my love life back up again, and oh boy, I felt like a real man. I wanted to love her, hug her, and I wanted to protect her. I could see myself spending my whole life with this girl. That was until two months of a relationship with her went downhill badly. Somehow, even Grace decided to cheat on me. Me of all the people. The guy she cheated on me with was an absolute douchebag. He was a loser. The guy was not on levels to me, but when I found out the truth, it turns out he was her ex. At first, she begged me to take her back, but she knew I didn't mess around. I was being serious and I said it square to her face. Grace, get the fuck out of my life. I never want to see you again. Saying those words while looking her square in the eyes made me feel sad inside. But I wasn't about to be disrespected by a girl. No, not me, Jacob. Some people may say I'm full of myself. Some of you losers may even accept your girlfriend or wife cheating or eyeing up other guys. I hate it. I am kind of overprotective, but cheating is where I draw the line. Grace cried, screamed, and went nuts. I grabbed all her stuff and threw it out of my house. She tried to call the cops and make up a whole bunch of false allegations. They were dropped within the first hearing of court because her case was so shit she didn't even pay for any lawyers. The girl was a mess and she realized that she hadn't thought things through. It backs up my point that a lot of my girlfriends and a lot of girls I know are led by emotion, feeling, not logic, or actual critical thinking. Something within me actually believes she didn't think this through. If she cheated on me with another guy, and I didn't find out, of course she thought she would stay with me, and that's probably true. If I hadn't have found out, then it would have been fine. 
I'm guessing that's why most girls cheat. They try and keep it quiet. And as long as the other person doesn't find out, then they're not going to flip out, or at least get angry. My reaction, I felt, was not an overreaction. It was just another girl, the 11th one to be exact. Once I threw her bags out, she tried everything to get me to take her back, but none of it worked. Once the false allegations were dropped, it went quiet. I blocked all her numbers and blocked her on all social media platforms and apps. I didn't hear from Grace for around a whole month, until January the 5th. That was when I heard from her once again. It wasn't a call, it wasn't a text, it wasn't a false account on a social media. It was her, dressed up in her outfit, walking up my driveway. I'd been single for the whole few months. I hadn't really considered anything else, and if anything, I think I deleted Tinder. But as I saw Grace walking up my drive, a little thing within me was sparked. I remembered all the good times. One side of my brain said, wow, it's Grace, she looks amazing. The other side said, look at that bitch, what's she doing on my property? She's not welcome back again. She doesn't respect me. Tell her to leave. She didn't ring the doorbell though. Instead, as I looked closer, I could see that she had a canister in her hand. A big one, the type that you put gas in when you break down or run out of it. It was dark out. Well, I'd say dusk, so half dark, half light. Visibility was maybe 80%, 70%. All of a sudden, I can see her doing something off to the side, right by my Rolls Royce. Almost immediately, I knew this wasn't going to be good. It was some type of revenge act, and seeing as I had ignored her and blocked her on everything, I guess this was her attempt at getting back at me. To get from my living room to the front door took at least 20 seconds, even if you started sprinting as quickly as you possibly could. That's how big the house was. I always kept the Rolls Royce parked on the drive, unless it's raining out, then I'd back it up into the garage to keep it clean. It hadn't rained in a while and we'd had a pretty dry January, but now I was about to realise what was going on. I turned and started running to the front door, by which time it was far too late. As I unlocked the door and opened it, I stood in my doorway to a sight that almost made me cry. The Rolls Royce was completely up in flames. She had covered it all in gas and then lit it. I ran inside and called 911. The fire department arrived and thank God I had CCTV. There was full evidence of Grace burning and setting a light to my Rolls Royce, pouring the whole thing with gasoline or some type of fuel. She was found, charged and actually put in prison for a short while. This is just a warning, most girls on Tinder are up for a fling, a mess around or maybe a long term relationship, but there are a couple of girls, I don't know why, they seem to have mental derangements, that they think they can cheat on you, and when you show them who's boss, who needs respect, they'll probably go to the lengths of actually killing you to get one up on you. This was a true narcissist, a true psychopath, or at least sociopath. She begged and begged, went through the phase of trying to make me feel sorry for her, crying, coming up with every excuse of why her ex got back with her. I wouldn't fall for any of it. As a result, she waited one month, and couldn't hold it any longer to show her true colours. Now she's where she belongs. To think that I was ever going to take her back, well, some of you must be crazy. Yes, I thought she was a totally different girl. She was sweet, lovely, attractive and caring. Everything I'd want in my future wife and mother to my kids. But then I realised she was hiding something darker and damn was she good at it.
I was never the type of person who was up front with his feelings. I love dropping hints here and there, and I finally make myself clear to you about my thoughts and feelings. I leave everything up for you to decide. That never worked for me. Regardless of how many times I've tried it, why is this moment the time I'm trying to tell you what I think? I can't help but wonder, do you ever feel like I'm just a piece of shit to you, because I'm always in your way when you're working together? Is that really why you don't talk to me anymore? It's probably because of my constant interference when we're apart. I can only imagine how annoying I must be, constantly nagging at you whenever we're together. You must hate me, hate me so much that you'd rather just push me away than continue living at the same life as me. Those were the words I told the last person I was in love with right before Leah left me on our third date. Her reply to me was very quick, very blunt and hurtful. She had been expecting something different after all that time, so that's why I felt the need to explain that to her. It didn't matter now anyway, because she wasn't going to be around for much longer anyway. She was off on another trip I heard, and she wouldn't come back until sometime next week. The thought made tears start to form in my eyes. I had no idea if this feeling would go away or not. I knew deep down that if I saw her again, it would only hurt more. Leah had broken my heart the first time, and it hadn't healed yet. So why bother hoping I could get over it by falling in love again? I was supposed to keep my hands clean, so after three years, I stopped talking to her altogether, because that was the most important thing. That was what I promised myself. The truth hurts though, I know that now, but then again, I never felt anything but pain until recently. It's been a long time since I went out, although I spent time outside of the house, no one had any idea why I didn't stay in one place for too long. I was an enigma, I was nice to have friends who understood me, at least somewhat, even though they sometimes weren't quite the best company. They were always so supportive though, and they did care about my well-being. I liked having people who cared about me like that. It was rare enough that I could find someone like that, especially with the way things had ended up. Whenever I was out with friends, they always showed up paired up. I felt left out most of the time, even if it was only a gathering of friends. Everyone had their girlfriends with them. I stopped showing it since it seemed like I was the third party. I played games a lot to avoid thinking about the fact that I was lonely. I tried to occupy my time as much as I could, and for the most of it, it was great. Everyone else seemed to want me to join them. I could play any game they suggested without even blinking, and it was easy to spend hours doing whatever the hell they wanted. Sometimes I joined in some random activities. Sometimes I sat quietly on my own while others played, occasionally making comments, sometimes taking photos, but mostly listening to the conversation. I still kept in touch with a few close people, but they were mostly the other members of the team I hung around with. And those guys got the point pretty quickly. They stopped asking me out to go to coffee shops. I was usually alone then anyway, without them hanging around with me. One time, my cousin visited me in school. I had an apartment in school, so it was easier for him to stay with me. We got talking, and since we were the closest in the family, we could talk about everything without leaving anything out. I guess it gave us an excuse for getting closer. After some time, he asked me a bunch of personal questions, which I answered honestly. So, any luck on the ladies? Jamie asked while I cooked us dinner. 
That was one thing I tried to avoid. Uh, nope. None whatsoever. Why? I mean, you look great. You take care of yourself and you seem really nice. Are they blind or something? Jeremy asked while he helped me. Let's just say everyone has different taste in people. I replied with a smile on my face. Yeah, that's what you said a year ago when I asked. You know what? I'm creating a Tinder profile. And it's for you. You're not going to stop me. Jamie was never willing to lose an argument, so I let him do whatever he wanted. He created a profile for me. During dinner we kept on swiping for a while until I matched with a girl. Her name was Leslie. She had brown skin, short curly hair and beautiful green eyes. I fell. I fell hard, fast and completely in love. Leslie was from California. She was 22 years old and she was stunning. I thought we might click instantly, considering both of us loved music and we shared similar common interests. But it didn't happen. Our interactions consisted mainly of me talking at length while she smiled and listened quietly. She always made sure to respond to my statements with smiles and comments as well. Every time we spoke, Every single time we talked on the phone or FaceTimed, I fell in love more and more, harder and harder each time. I realised that I couldn't possibly compete with her, and on our third date, she invited me over to the apartment that she shared with a roommate who was going to be out of town for the weekend. Man was I happy to see her again. I got dressed and was ready to head out for our date. I couldn't make it. There was an emergency in our lab where a lot of our group projects were kept, and I was in charge of it. So I ended up having to call Leslie and told her about it. She sounded shocked at first, but told me to take care of the emergency. The lab caught fire. Thankfully, nothing was lost, but I spent the entire evening out there waiting to see our project. By the time I did, it was late. I called Leslie a few times, but I couldn't get hold of her, so I drove back to my apartment, tired and hungry. I walked into the dark apartment and turned on the light. I was startled to see Leslie sitting in the dark, staring right at the door. I jumped a bit, but calmed down the moment I saw it was her. What the hell are you doing here? I called you and you didn't pick up, I said as I walked towards her. Something in my head told me to stop, as she wasn't smiling. Leslie got up and stared me down. You missed our date. I sat there all day. You know, this wasn't the first time this happened to me. I'm so used to it that I've lost count, Leslie said in a sarcastic tone. But I told you about it before I left. I told you I wasn't going to make it. I tried to explain but she seemed like she wasn't willing to listen anymore. I made the mistake of moving a step closer. I saw her hand move right before I jumped back. I took a glance at the blade as it cut through my shirt and left a large wound on my arm. Fuck. I screamed as I jumped away from the crazy psycho that was my girlfriend at that time. Leslie didn't seem to have an expression on her face. I watched her blood pour out as I tried to slow down the bleeding. My shirt was stained in seconds and the blood was blinding. She started shouting insults at me like a crazy woman. I backed up further and further away as she just stood there dancing around with the knife. Finally, my back hit the wall. Fuck, I mumbled to myself. My breathing became rapid and short. Leslie approached me slowly, but just threw the knife to the floor. She was in tears and started taking the piss out of my conversations I'd had with her. Over and over again, she was repeating words, dates, and places that I remember I told her, all in a high-pitched, childish tone, as if to mock me, as there I was, bleeding everywhere, over my own apartment floor. Eventually, 
She helped herself to a drink and then left. My arm stopped bleeding as I had applied pressure to the edge of it. Somehow, there was blood everywhere. I did call the ambulance and they came pretty quick. When they turned up, they said that my car was smashed a bit as there was glass all over the floor by the parking lot entrance. It turns out Leslie had taken a baseball bat and smashed up my entire car. To say that this girl was insane would have been an understatement. I had my arm sorted and looked at, and was back to work the next day in a cast and a sling. The reality is that I wasn't expecting this. But, I guess you could say, life throws tests your way, and when you're not expecting them, that's when you get them.